Hi, I'm Dr. Brian Hoffman, the Chief Medical Officer, Executive Vice President of the nonprofit CLL Society and a CLL patient myself. Dr. Breyer, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes. Hello, I'm Dr. Emily Breyer. I'm a third year hematology oncology fellow at the National Institutes of Health, and I research in CLL. Dr. Breyer, uh, we're both very aware of how the BTK inhibitors have revolutionized the care in CLL and patients have much better outcomes because of this class of drugs, but they do come with some adverse events, some side effects. And one of the most prominent and sometimes the most dangerous are cardiac. And you've got a study going to look at that. First, can you explain why you're looking at cardiac events in particular? Absolutely. So just as you said, BTK inhibitors have revolutionized the treatment of CLL, and they're currently indicated for indefinite treatment of CLL until toxicity or progression of disease. But what we see in the clinic is that upwards of 30%, sometimes as high as 50% of patients have side effects from BTK inhibitors and have to stop the therapy. And some of the side effects that we've seen in our clinic and, and chatting with providers across the nation and even across the world are the particularly potentially worrisome cardiac side effects. Historically, this has been high blood pressure or hypertension um, and atrial fibrillation, this irregular rhythm of the heart um, that carries a risk of stroke. But we've also seen heart failure and some of the more serious ventricular arrhythmias that can be related to sudden death. So the purpose of the trial is to systematically screen and monitor patients who are on BTK inhibitors um, to evaluate them uh, for any cardiac arrhythmia or um, any kind of change in the heart structure or function so that we can best decide and determine who's most at risk for these cardiac side effects and how do we identify them as soon as possible to potentially take these patients off of the drug uh, before they have a, a potential dangerous event. Well, this sounds very important and also very interesting because we want patients to be able to take these drugs, but we want them to take them safely. So tell us a little bit more about the trial design and what's involved for a patient. Um, Absolutely. Um, so the trial has two main groups. One group is patients who are not yet on a BTK inhibitor, but are planning to start one within 12 weeks. And the second group is patients who are already on a BTK inhibitor. Both groups will have- so a, be, be, Before I, I'm gonna stop you there. Does please. it matter if it's frontline or relaxed refractory? It could be after other therapies. So either it, case is good, yeah. Either case, it can be a BTK inhibitor in any line of therapy. And importantly, it can be a BTK inhibitor that's monotherapy given alone or in combination with another drug. So we're kind of taking all comers who are on a BTK inhibitor um, for any indication, not just CLL. Um, and we uh, plan on performing a variety of cardiac tests for the group of patients who are not yet on a BTK inhibitor. We're going to perform um, tests before they start the BTK inhibitor and then repeat the same battery of tests six months after staying on the BTK inhibitor. And the reason why it's designed that way is the data that we have shows that if a patient is going to have a cardiac adverse event, specifically atrial fibrillation, it classically appears in the first six months. It's a little bit of a, of a muddy distin distinction because atrial fibrillation is the most common arrhythmia in the aging population and 10% um, of people over 70 are in AFib all of the time. So the risk goes up for an aging population but we really hope to um, do some systematic screening to, to generate a number that really helps us to identify the true incidence of cardiac arrhythmias. So you, you said you'll do a battery of tests. Um, I imagine you'll do an, an electrocardiogram, an EKG. Um, what other tests will you be doing to look at the heart? We will be doing an EKG, a stress um, exercise stress EKG. So a patient will get on the treadmill, elevate their heart rate, um, and then have an EKG. And if someone is not able to tolerate the exercise part of that, if there's you know knee problems, hip problems, uh, we'll be able to do an MRI of the heart um, and with medication, uh, add some stress to the heart to be able to kind of generate the same uh, type of tracing 
so that we can look at how the heart performs under stress. Um, the third thing will be an ultrasound of the heart, which is also called an echocardiogram. And all three of these tests are non-invasive done in an afternoon in our clinic. And then the last two pieces of the cardiac uh, studies that we are doing, um, one is called a Bardi monitor. It's actually an adhesive patch that sticks in the center of the chest. It's almost like a, a very sticky post-it note. And it stays on for up to two weeks throughout sleep and showering and exercise. And it continuously records uh, the heart's rate and rhythm. And the goal of this is to catch what the heart is doing when a patient may not feel an arrhythmia. Sometimes, you know, you can have symptoms like shortness of breath or heart fluttering or skipping a beat. But the purpose of this two week monitor is to really take a, a long snapshot at what the heart does when we may not feel that something is going on. So at the end of the two weeks monitor, the patients will remove the patch themselves and actually drop it in the mail. And then that data will be uploaded onto the computer. And we work with a variety of uh, cardiologists and also heart rhythm specialists to analyze this data and see what exactly is going on. And the, the last test that is a part of the study, each participant will be given a cardio mobile device. And this is a, an FDA cleared device that's about the size of a stick of gum, and it's cleared to detect cardiac arrhythmias. So the device syncs to an app on a smartphone, and you place both fingers on either side of the device for 30 seconds. And we're asking patients to do this when they feel any type of cardiac symptom, chest pain, shortness of breath, dizziness, heart skipping a beat. And in 30 seconds, this will generate an EKG that the, the patients will then email to us. And it's um, the purpose of this is to get some data about symptomatic arrhythmias. And the most important thing, Brian, to emphasize here is that while we would like um, patients to gather this cardiac tracing if they're having these symptoms, this is a research protocol. So we do want them to go to the emergency room to get sort of evaluated um, and treated for whatever um, cardiovascular symptom that they're having. That's the most important thing but we are trying to also get a little bit of information about what exactly is going on that is causing um, these arrhythmias. And that's, that's the main purpose of the study is, you know, we, we understand in animals what causes atrial fibrillation with BTK inhibitors, but the precise mechanism in humans is actually unknown. We have a lot of questions to answer. You also mentioned hypertension. Will you, is that something that'll be part of this protocol? Yes, absolutely. Patients' blood pressure will be monitored. And, and we know, Brian, that um, there are certain risk factors that have been identified for which patients are the most at risk for atrial fibrillation on ibrutinib specifically. And people with a history of high blood pressure or a history of atrial fibrillation before starting the drug are at higher risk for developing atrial fibrillation on the drug. Now, it sounds from a patient's perspective, pretty simple. I mean, there's one visit um, and it sounds like that would be like a, a, a one day visit or two day visit, the first one, and then six months later, the, the same. And is that it? Is that, uh, are then you're done? That's exactly right. Um, for the, the two groups of the study, one before starting the BTK inhibitor, you do have two mandatory appointments, one for full cardiac testing before starting the drug, and then you come back and have another mandatory visit after six months. And then any subsequent visits are totally optional and only if um, the subject develops any type of concerning cardiovascular symptom. Um, the patients who are already on a BTK inhibitor only have one required visit. Um, and then of course, you know they're welcome to come back as well should they develop, we'd like them to come back should they develop any additional arrhythmia and if someone comes back for one of these optional appointments, we would repeat all of the full cardiac testing to see, was there a change in the shape or function or electrical conduction of the heart that may have increased the risk of having an arrhythmia? Okay, well, that sounds pretty simple. And I assume like um, other trials at the NIH, uh, most of the patient's expenses are covered, is that correct? That's correct. There are resources available to help with transportation and lodging. Cool. And what about the medication? If you prescribe the medication, is that covered or would their insurance have to cover that? That's a great question. Um, this study is just looking at the cardiac side effects of the BTK inhibitor. So we're actually not prescribing um, the BTK inhibitors. Gotcha. So that you wouldn't be the one who 
That's chose the BTK inhibitor, their uh, local oncologist or their CLL doctor would be doing that. That's correct. Is the trial open now or when does yes. it open? The trial opened on March 1st um, and some data about the trial is available on clinicaltrials.gov, including my contact information and the contact information for the research nurse, Susan Soto. And we'd be more than happy to kind of answer any questions or chat about eligibility. Uh, any age limits on the trial? 110 is the, <laughs> is the top age on the trial and the minimum age is 18. All right, that's pretty broad, yeah. <laughs> I think you'll catch most CLL. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> Any final thoughts or anything you want to say to the uh, CLL community about the uh, trial? I, I guess the, uh, the final thought would be, um, you know, the, the CLL community is incredibly well-informed and, and well-educated and Many, if not most patients know that ibrutinib does carry, seem to carry a higher risk for cardiac events compared with the newer generations of BTK inhibitors like acalabrutinib and zanabrutinib, which was recently approved. But what we know is that data for long-term follow-up for these later um, newer versions of ibrutinib, acalabrutinib and zanabrutinib is limited. And, and we hypothesize and have some data to support that there still is a cardiac risk with these newer BTK inhibitors. So I think that this study is um, incredibly relevant and still remains relevant, even though we have newer updated versions of ibrutinib. Um, patients on acalabrutinib and zanabrutinib are still at risk for cardiac events. Dr. Breyer, uh Thank you and your colleagues for all the great research you're doing at the National Institutes of Health. We're so excited about this and uh, um, we'll post this and we'll include a link to the uh, trial. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me, Brian. Take care.